Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for all being here this morning. It's such a beautiful day, and it's a Sunday after Easter, so those two things combined make this what has always been traditionally called Low Sunday. But you're doing pretty good being here, and it looks like we have, uh, let's see, about 20 of you on here on Zoom, so that's good as well. Can the Zoom folks hear me? Thumbs up, please. I see it. Okay, we're good. All right, well... Welcome to the Sunday after Easter, and as I always like to remind us in some form or another, that Easter is not one day, it is every day. It's not one Sunday, but it's also today. There is life to be lived because Christ lives, and so we rejoice in that and come together today to worship. So, I want to take a moment and let us share anything we need to share by way of church and what's going on. Anything in this part of the building? There's Esther. Go ahead, Esther. A thank you to everybody who came out to help make egg sandwiches and steak sandwiches for daycare's uh, playground. I think they took in about $1,297. And Kathleen and I had puzzles and books and a few other things out, and we raised $120 for Ephrata Manor. Wonderful. Yes, a big thank you to everybody for helping out with that. Our care center families provided all the ingredients for the breakfast sandwiches. The Men's Brotherhood donated the ingredients for some cheese steaks that we made, and uh, several of you were able to be here and help us out, and that was, that was great. It was uh, well attended, ran out of food, and... Uh, that was good, so. Other things here? Over here? Go ahead, Linda. Let us know about our flowers this morning. Uh, the flowers this morning are presented by Skip Kinden and in celebration of spring. What a good day for it. Good day for it, Skip. Thank you, Skip, for having this. Anyone else over here? Yeah, of course, he's got a big thank you to share, I believe, as well. Just a quick thank you to everybody who helped out with the mulching yesterday. It started out a little slow, but we got a whole bunch of folks at the end and got it done in like two hours, I think. So it was around 18 or 20 yards of mulch we moved in two hours. So that's pretty impressive. Thanks a lot. Helps when you have some nice equipment to help out with that. So that was good. But again, a lot of you came out to help with that. We had lots going on here yesterday. And just good to see things happening around the, the church uh, facility here. So thanks for being a part of that. Um, quick note on Philip's uh, new handbell group, a beginner's group, for those of you who might be interested in wanting to learn the handbells. Uh, so there's a beginner's group that he's starting, and their first practice is going to be next Monday, not tomorrow, but next Monday, May the 2nd, at 10 o'clock in the morning, correct? Correct. Got it. I got it right this time, so there we go. And a couple pastoral concerns to note. Uh, some of you may have already seen uh, in, in the paper this morning, Nolan Lead passed away early on Friday morning. Uh, so keep your prayers, please, with Nolan's family. <laughs> The services are going to be on Wednesday, or I should say service Tuesday night. There's a viewing at Roseboro Stradling Funeral Home from 5 to 8. Uh, but the service, um, kind of a memorial service, because the um, burial will be private prior to the service. But at 5 o'clock on Wednesday, here in the sanctuary, we will have a service uh, in remembrance and, and memorial for Nolan. So uh, I know the family appreciates your prayers and your thoughts. No one all the way till I, I did get to see him on Thursday evening prior to his passing and and he was not that responsive. I mean he woke up and, and knew I was there uh, but the week prior I was with him and uh, he is still thinking highly of his church and and the being a part of the cheesesteak so I told him we had cheesesteak sale and he said well you know I helped start that so some of his last thoughts were of, a, of his church and being able to serve so um, just keep him in your thoughts, his family in your thoughts, please. And also ask for prayers for Mike and Patty Lesher. Uh, some of you know, but maybe not all of you, that Mike and Patty are gonna be relocating to their son in Georgia. 
Uh, they're looking forward to the opportunity to, to live with him and, and their new grandchild and just uh, uh, be there. So they're heading out on Tuesday, I believe is their final date of leaving time here. So uh, keep Mike and Patty, who I suspect are probably on Zoom because they always are, uh, keep them in your thoughts and in your prayers. And as they make this move, and I'm sure if you Zoom in with us on Sunday mornings or Tuesday evenings, they are usually on uh, joining us and we'll probably continue to do that even from Georgia. But keep your thoughts with them as they're making this, this move that has all sorts of emotions to it. They, uh, on one hand, are gonna miss being here, but certainly are looking forward to, to being with their son and, and his family. So keep them in your thoughts. We have much that God is doing among us and through us, a life that's all around us that we should never forget, that there is resurrection. Resurrection, which is the hope and the word for the lead family today, but resurrection, which is the hope and the life that courses through us here as we worship this morning and all folks who are worshiping today with the good news of Christ's resurrection. So we bring ourselves before Christ. We bring ourselves before our Lord and let our hearts be ready to worship him. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you this day. We thank you for the beauty of the day. We thank you for the evidence of a new life all around us, not only with spring upon us, but most importantly with the proclamation coming forth from churches today, not just, not just stopping after last Sunday, but today declaring the resurrection and new life of Jesus Christ. Resurrection and new life for us, the conquering of sin and death and all that goes with it. So may we continue to rejoice and be glad in that good news and be the people you call us to be as we come and as we worship, as we sing, as we pray. May we find you here in Jesus' name. Amen. So I invite you to rise as we're going to sing our first hymn this morning. We're going to sing to Christ. Jesus Christ is risen today. Let's sing it out together.
that hymn is a proclamation of what we believe, the salvation we have in Jesus Christ. And in that hymn, we sing about the forgiveness of our sins, the conquering of our sins, the taking away of the guilt. So let us take a moment and bow our hearts before God and confess those sins to him because he still wants us to be mindful that as we come to him, we come to him because we need him. We come to him because our sin would otherwise separate us from him. But in Christ, he has conquered that divide and brought us together with him again. So let's bring our sins before our Lord as we bow our hearts and confess. Let us pray. Gracious God, it is a joy and a relief to be able to declare the resurrection of Christ, a resurrection that proves that our sins have been taken care of and conquered, that you have loved us despite ourselves, and yet we still seem to want to roll that stone back over our lives. We still want to hide ourselves in our guilt and our shame and still find ourselves walking in our own ways instead of yours. So we come today and confess that. We come today asking that we might again be reminded of the life that you give us in Christ and the, and the direction you lead us toward and the words you've implanted into our hearts. Forgive us, Lord, for all those ways in which we just do our own thing, in which we continue to put Jesus back on the cross instead of Keep them alive in our lives, in our hearts, in our ways. Do you find our confessions genuine, humble, and real? As we bring ourselves before you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Again, the words we sang are our affirmation of forgiveness, our reminder of grace. Christ is risen above all of our sin, despite it. And with that resurrection, there is life, forgiveness, and peace. Thanks be to God for what he has given each of us today in a resurrection and a life of Jesus Christ. Amen. So we have that peace. We have that life. So take a moment and declare that to each other as we pass the peace of Christ to one another. The peace of Christ be with you all. Peace, everybody. Peace of Christ be with you all. Peace of Christ be with you all. Peace of Christ be with you. Peace be with you. Peace of Christ be with you all. Peace. I'm going to use this, Corey, if that's okay. I'll use the word. Come on up and have a seat with me, if you would, please. Can you hear me? There we go. So how was Easter? Was it good? That's good. Well, you know what? It continues. It doesn't just stop with one day. Just because you have one day of eating candy doesn't mean you can't have every day of eating candy. Now I'm in trouble. Uh -huh. No, but every day is a day of resurrection. You had a lot of candy. I did too, Finn. That's all part of the front of Easter. But it's always a reminder that with Easter, Jesus is alive. That's our big story, right? Jesus is alive. He was dead, but he's alive. And last week when you were here, we had all the flowers around here, and I told you, I reminded you that those flowers are our way of reminding us that there's always new life. And now it's springtime outside, and you're starting to see the trees are getting green, and the bushes are getting flowers, and the flowers are coming up from the ground, all as a reminder of new life. You have a flower inside. Very good. Exactly. That's what we said last week. When they grow up, it reminds us of God raising Jesus from the dead. And don't forget, those always start with little seeds, right? 
just a little seed in the ground can become a big flower or a big bush or a big tree. It doesn't take much. You don't want too much water. Exactly. You are going to become a horticulturist, or whatever you call it. You're in good shape. Man. So, yes, you got to take care of the seed so that it grows. We got to take care of the seed of knowing Jesus died for us so that that keeps growing in our life. You know what it means to take care of that seed? Just like you put water on the seed and you put sunshine on the seed so it grows, it's good enough. Too much. You gotta have the right amount. But you always gotta have sunshine and you always have to have water. So if we want to let the seed of Jesus love grow in us, we always have to have things like church, and we have to have things like learning about God and praying and things that remind us of God's love. So always make sure you have things going on throughout your day that remind you of God's love. Okay? Just like Easter isn't just one Sunday, God's love isn't just one day. It's all the time. Okay? So you're going to go with Miss Stephanie in a moment, and you're going to learn a little bit more about those seeds and growing God's love and remembering all around us God is showing his love by his creation and his life, and we get to be part of that as we go show other people the love and the life of Christ, okay? Let's pray. We thank you, O oh Lord, for loving us like you do. I thank you every week for that because, boy, sometimes it's easy to forget that. That's a little seed you put in our heart that you want to grow bigger and bigger and bigger every day. So remind Rowan and Finn and Lila of your love every day. Put things and people in their life that help grow that love and spring it into action so they can share it with other people. Bless them as they go now and learn more about you. And we thank you today for all you give us. Amen. All right. There is Miss Steph. And here she comes. Join her. We let Philip share with us this morning. We let that music again keep our hearts worshipful and mindful of the very love of this world.
Thank you for sharing that with us. I'm going to invite Ed to come forward and share a scripture. And as Ed's coming up, I have one addition to my announcement. You can come up, Ed. One addition to my announcements that I forgot, and that is after Nolan's service at 5 o'clock, around 6 o'clock, they're going to have a luncheon in the fellowship hall. I'm looking for some folks who might be available to help put the food out for them. So if you have time on, Sun on Wednesday, uh, like 6 o'clock, and can help out, just see me after church, and uh, I'll talk to you about that. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Our lesson today is from the book of John, chapter 20, verses 1 to 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the outer wrappings, but rolled up and placed by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in and saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that, most, that, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes, and Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over and looked in the tomb, and she saw the two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she, when she had said this, she turned and saw Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father, and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that she, that she had said these things to her, that he had said these things to her. May the Lord add his blessing upon the reading of his holy word. Thank you, Ed. There we go. So let's uh, look at this account of the resurrection. This is the one from the Gospel of John. If you read each Gospel's account of the resurrection, you get kind of a different picture. Some people get caught up in that. Some people get troubled by the fact that all the resurrection stories are slightly different, and John's is especially different. But Kind of the simple answer to that is if you had four people witness an accident, you had them all give an accident report, each one's going to have some different details. The details in John are very interesting. So here is Mary Magdalene. She comes while it's still dark, is what John tells us. It's still dark, and she comes to the tomb. She notices the stone is rolled away from the tomb. And she immediately runs back to the disciples, specifically to Peter, and the disciple whom Jesus loved, who we believe was John, is just a, a name that John gave himself. 
and told them the words, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. So as far as we know from this point in the story, it was dark. She had to stoop down. I think we have this idea of a tomb uh, of being one in which you just walk into, but John presents the tomb as being something that you have to stoop down and almost crawl into to get there. It was still dark, so she really couldn't see in that tomb. But because the stone was rolled away, she immediately interpreted the situation as, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they've laid him. And upon hearing that, Peter and John go sprinting to the tomb. And John, the younger one, gets there first, but he doesn't go in. He stoops in, he kind of sees some linen cloths there, and then Peter rushes past him, goes into the tomb, and once he gets in there, he sees the linen cloths laying there, he sees the face cloth that would have been over Jesus' face laying at the other end of the tomb, and then John comes in, and it says, they believed. Now, sometimes we think of that, or some people interpret that as they believed. Jesus had been resurrected. But that isn't what they believed. What did they believe? They believed that they had taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they laid him. They believe with Mary that Jesus is dead and has been his body stolen or removed and placed somewhere else. That's what they believe. Because it says, for they have yet to understand the scriptures about his resurrection. And they went home. Odd, but they went home. But Mary stays outside the tomb. And she looks in, and instead of seeing linen cloths, she sees two angels. And the angels say to her, why are you crying? And she says, again, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So now she's still outside, she's still there at the tomb, and Jesus is there. But she does not know that it's Jesus. And Jesus says to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Who are you looking for? And again, she says basically the same thing Sir, if you have taken him away, Tell me where you have laid him. And of course, then Jesus says her name, and she realizes it's him. Now, when we hear John's account, one of the primary questions that rises in people's minds, and it rose in some minds this week, as some people read the gospel reading throughout the week and gave me some thoughts, and one of the thoughts was, how is it that Mary doesn't know it's Jesus? Why doesn't she realize it's him? It says she supposed him to be the gardener when he first appeared, when he first talked to her. It says she supposed it was him, it was the gardener. The word supposed there means she formed an opinion. She had this idea in her mind that that's who it was, a gardener. So why didn't she know it was Jesus? Now, some people have said, well, it's because the sun was rising at a certain angle and she probably couldn't tell it was him, and like she probably was looking into the sun. Or she was crying so hard that she couldn't tell it was him through her tears. But there's a more genuine and real answer to why she didn't know that it was Jesus. And that is, because she kept believing they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they've laid him. She believed, she supposed, she had the opinion, the interpretation of her situation, the supposition that Jesus is dead and that Jesus has been laid somewhere, that Jesus is dead and that his work is done. You remember the resurrection story of the two gentlemen who were walking out away from Jerusalem going toward Emmaus. We call it the road to Emmaus story. 
So they are leaving. Jesus has been crucified. They're leaving town. And as they're leaving town, talking about what's happened, Jesus appears to them. But like Mary, they do not know it's Jesus. So we ask the question, why don't they know it's Jesus? And again, some people have had the answer, well, again, it was what, however the sun was positioned or, or he was behind them and they really didn't glance back and look at him. But there's an easier, more understandable and more real reason why they didn't know it was Jesus. And that's because they say to Jesus, not knowing it's him, but they say to him, how do you not know about Jesus and Nazareth, who the chief priests and the scribes handed over to the Pharaoh, uh, handed over to the authorities, and they crucified him, and he died. And we even thought he was going to be the redeemer of Israel, the one to set Israel free. Why did they not know it's Jesus? Because they believed Jesus was dead and his work was done. We thought he was going to be the guy to redeem Israel. We thought he was going to be this Messiah who was going to set us all free. And because it didn't happen as they imagined it, as they supposed it, as their opinions had projected, the end to which they thought this was going to look like, they had no reason to believe this person walking with them was Jesus. Because Jesus is dead and his work is done. So this empty tomb becomes for Mary, it becomes for Peter and John, the news of it for the guys walking on the road to Emmaus, all of them, it becomes this place of conclusions that are drawn and suppositions that are made and opinions that are had and ends that are created. All along, people missing Jesus because they're only considering their own conclusions and their own suppositions and their own opinions and their own ends. So the resurrection of Jesus for us is a reminder of who we're dealing with here. We are dealing with God. And when, when it comes to God in Jesus Christ, there are some things we have to remember about this God that the resurrection states loud and clear for us. First of all, the resurrection tells us that death is not the end. If we are people of the God of Jesus Christ, then death, physical as well as all the deaths that we experience in our daily living, that is not the end. Not with this God. We might look at death and jump to the conclusion or have the opinion or the interpretation or the supposition that everything's done, it's over, but not with God. The resurrection says death is not the end. The resurrection says there is more to the story. Not only the story of Jesus, there's more to any story in which we believe God is in our life. If we are people who believe the God of Jesus Christ is in our life and we are in a relationship with that God, then the resurrection tells us that any story in our life, anything that we're, we're experiencing, that story always has more to it than your conclusions, my opinions, our interpretation, the suppositions we have or state. There's always going to be more to the story of that circumstance, that situation, that person. Because that's what the resurrection says. We want to draw a conclusion. We want to form an opinion. We want to have a supposition. We want to make an assumption. We want to come to a, an end. We believe in God, the God of the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. So there's always more. I used this line last week because it's one of my favorites. Resurrection means, if I can get back to that, the world has not heard the last of Jesus Christ. He is not dead. He is not done. And we are the people who get that shared with the world that that name is above all names and means something huge to wherever you're at in life, whatever you're experiencing. The resurrection also tells us that God has the last word, not us. 
the last word in anything in our life, in her life, in his life, in their life. We don't get to make that last word. God has the last word. Go to the last book of the Bible, Revelation, which somehow is supposed to be saying something to us about the last times and the end of it all. The very first thing that God is quoted as saying in the book of Revelation, the first thing is this. God is saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega. And the last thing, almost the last thing that God says in the book of Revelation in chapter 22 is, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. God is the last word. God has the last word in your life. That circumstance or situation that you think has just closed all the doors, all the windows to something, that's your conclusion. That's your interpretation. That's your opinion. But if God's working in your life, he gets the last say. Resurrection also tells us that we shouldn't be so quick to form an opinion. We really need to hear that today. The biggest problem of our world probably right now is how opinionated we've all become and how much we want to hold on to our opinions and our unwillingness to recognize that most of what we're holding on to is opinions. Opinions get in our way, but it's so easy for us to grab a hold of them. I'm often reminded of, and I think I've probably shared this once before, but uh, supposedly there was an MGM executive in the entertainment world there at MGM, and when he was assessing a newcomer by the name of Fred Astaire, I'm looking around, and I think everybody here knows who that is, so I don't have to like explain. But when this executive was assessing Fred Astaire, this was the assessment that he published and he passed on to the rest of the MGM body about Fred Astaire. He can't act, he can't sing, he's balding, and he can dance a little. Don't be so quick to form opinions. There are situations, circumstances, and above all else, there are people in our lives. People like Jesus, who our opinion is, he's dead, he's done. There are people in our lives that our opinion is they are this and they are that, and we write them off. Resurrection tells us, hey Mary, hey Peter, hey John, hey Brad, hey Nicole, hey all of us. Don't be so quick to form that opinion. God's doing something here. So likewise, remember that our opinion is not the same as God's truth. Mary had the opinion that they took him from the grave, from the tomb, and laid him somewhere. That was her opinion. But that wasn't God's truth. It's like the little first grader who went to school for his first day and he handed the teacher a note from his mother and the note said, the opinions expressed by this child are not necessarily those of his parents. Our opinions are not necessarily those of God's, of God. God has truth, we have opinions. So when we look at situations and circumstances and people, our opinions about those matters and those people are not necessarily God's views. So, resurrection teaches us not to jump to conclusions. Do not jump to conclusions about your circumstances and your situations, and especially the people. Because we believe in a God who is a God of resurrection, there is new life possible in everything. Don't make a conclusion that God hasn't made. Because when we start to draw conclusions, we start to limit everything. Again, a little story I was reminded of, I came across about two men who were on the same platform waiting for the train. And one of the men was a, an older middle-aged man who was very conservatively dressed in a business suit and he was holding a briefcase. 
And the other was a young man in jeans and a t-shirt, and he had a backpack. The older man looked at his gold, expensive wrist, wristwatch, and the young man noticed that. So the young man said, uh, could you tell me what the time is, sir? The older man just kept his focus straight ahead, didn't say a word, didn't acknowledge the young man, didn't even act like he heard him. So the young man uh, just repeated again. He said, sir, sir, could you please tell me the time? And again, the older man fixated straight ahead, no acknowledgement of the young man. So finally, the young man says, hey, look, I just want to know the time. And I noticed you looked at your wristwatch, and I know you know the time. Can you just please let me know the time? Why, why can't you tell me that? And the older man says, look, he finally relents, and he says, listen. He says, if I tell you the time, we're going to strike up a conversation. And we're going to probably like each other. And maybe we'll become friends. And so I might invite you to dinner at my house. And you're going to meet my unmarried daughter. And you're going to, you're going to be attracted to her. And you're going to ask her out on a date. And she's going to say yes because you're her type. And you're probably going to really enjoy each other's company. And you're going to propose to her. And she's probably going to say yes. And then you're going to get married. And he stopped. The young man said, well, Okay, let's assume all that's happened. That happened. So, so what's so wrong with that? And the older man replies, because I don't want my daughter marrying a guy who can't afford a watch. Now, fun little story, but in it, it's a reminder of our lives. I mean, we all jump to so many conclusions. We're so many steps ahead in a situation, but forgetting that all those steps that we are ahead are our own little conclusions we've jumped to. And in the process, we've missed so many things going on in the situation or the circumstance or with the person. We are people of resurrection. That means that Jesus is not dead. Jesus is not done. This circumstance or situation is not done. And that person is not done. So don't jump to that conclusion. Don't, as they say, place a period where God places a comma. You ever heard that statement? Don't place a period where God places a comma. If we start placing conclusions and periods and ends in places that they shouldn't be, it messes everything up. Just like reading this, if I can get to it. Thank you. Your donation just helped someone get a job. There's a period there that doesn't belong. But because it's there, it changes everything. Likewise, in our lives, when we start putting periods where God is trying to do things, we're going to mess up everything. We're missing so much. We're misinterpreting so much. We're misinterpreting our situations and our circumstances and the people. So don't lay down Jesus. Notice what Mary kept saying. They've taken it from the tomb. He's still dead. Where have they laid him? The moment we lay Jesus down, so to speak, is the moment that we try to fix him in position. We try to fix him with our suppositions and our opinions and, and, and our conclusions and our ends. But the God of Jesus Christ, the love of God that he has shown us in Jesus Christ, cannot be laid down and fixed with a conclusion or opinion. It's a love that's alive with resurrection. It's a love that goes far beyond our conclusions and our opinions and our viewpoints and our interpretations and our ways of looking at things. Far beyond. That's the resurrection good news for us. God is not dead. Jesus is not dead. He is alive. God's love is alive. That's what we get to proclaim. Likewise, that's what we get to receive each and every day, even though we and the people around us are going to use our own and their own conclusions and opinions and interpretations and suppositions and ends to try to limit our life in some way from that love, to try to tell us that love has conditions or that love has limits, but it doesn't. 
There is nothing that limits God's love to you. When we come here on a Sunday morning or when you do it in the privacy of your own personal prayer time and confess your sins to God, those sins do not limit God's love from you. In fact, those sins confessed free us up to again receive a love that broke through tomb and stone and conclusion and opinion and interpretation and supposition and assumption. So for us, all these things are truths from the resurrection for us. Death is not the end. There is more to any and every story, any and every person. The world has not heard the last of Jesus Christ, and that's because you and I carry that good news with us wherever we go. God has the last word. Not you, not me. So don't be so quick to form an opinion. Don't believe your opinion is God's truth. Don't jump to conclusions. Don't place a comma or a period where God places the comma and don't lay Jesus down. He is alive. He can't be laid down. So don't do it. With those conclusions and suppositions you place on life and you place on people. Instead, let the love of God break through it all. Let's pray. As we pray, we bring before God our tithes and our offerings. We bring before God the gifts of our heart, prayers of our spirit. We bring before God, who is a God of life, all that we have. So to you, O oh Lord God, we come this morning. We have brought ourselves in worship with songs and prayers in our very presence. We bring before you the bounty of what you have given us that we might use to be a blessing unto others. We bring those tithes and offerings and ask, Lord, that you would take them and use them, that you would uh, multiply them in some way as you did the, the bread and the fishes for the, the thousands of people that were in need. Use what meager funding we've given this morning to to again make true and make alive this good news that there is no limit to your love. Not even the limits that sometimes tell us that uh, we, we don't have enough or we can't do enough or, or whatever those lacks that we have. Those are our conclusions. Those are our suppositions. Those are our opinions. But you are God. So may you reinvigorate us and rejuvenate us in a relationship with you as that God, the God of a living Jesus Christ. Breathe your love into us in an endless way that reminds us that nothing can stop it. And breathe your love through us in that same endless way that shows that nothing can stop that love, that it goes to wherever and to whomever it needs. We are your church and your people. We are the people of resurrection. May we live this life, may it grow and grow to spread the fragrance of your love wherever we are. May that love and all the peace and the courage and the strength and the comfort that comes with it be with Nolan's family in these coming days as they grieve his passing, but as they begin to celebrate a life that, that really has been lived and, and has been enjoyed and appreciated. May that fragrance of your love be, be evident for Mike and Patty as they go through these final hours of, of preparation to move and as they make this move. May you be with them, granting them peace and assurance, strength of body, mind, and spirit. And for all of us in whatever circumstance, whatever situation, whatever people or person we might be dealing with, that we've already formed our opinions, created our conclusions, come to our ends. May we be open to having you remind us that you are the last word, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Be that for us, be that for St. John's, be that for all who go forth in the name of the living Savior. It's in his name that we pray. It's his prayer that we share. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I'm going to invite you all to rise and we're going to sing our final hymn together. We sang a couple of these verses last week, but we're going to sing the full hymn, the full four verses. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hearts to heaven. Let's sing it out together. Let us go. And finally, as we go, God is moved.